I'm, I'm Ed Moran. I am a New York State licensed guide. Um, I'll start up our share up our presentation now. And but um, so many of you know me. I've been with the ADK for over ten years. I've been very active in this chapter. Um, I have led many hikes, and I continue to lead hikes for both the ADK and also the Caskill 3500 Club. I am certified wilderness first responder. I'm a member of the Catskill Mountain Search and Rescue Team, and I am a director of the New York State Outdoor Guys Association. This isn't a sales pitch for me. Um, I, it, it, it's about guiding in New York State, and I am a guide, so if there's a little bit of that, it, it's not meant to be offensive at all. Um, it, it, it is just hopefully be interesting, informative, and, and, and like I had said um, in the description, that it hopefully would give people who aren't guides some ideas for how to make their own trips better, because really we have to do the same things. In, in New York State, guiding is a licensed profession. Basically, to get paid to guide in New York State, you have to have a license. Um, that requirement doesn't apply to club hike leaders. It doesn't require to Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and I think certain types of summer camps as well. But pretty much anybody else that's going to get paid to, uh, and the official wording's up there, uh, services for hire that include directing, instructing, or aiding a client in hiking, camping, or paddling must have a license. I am a, I am a hiking and camping guide. There are also licenses for fishing, hunting, uh, climbing as in uh, ice climbing and rock climbing and uh, whitewater activities. Okay, um, the uh, guide license program in New York State is uh, administered by the DEC. Uh, we, uh, we get to know some of them very well and uh, if you're going to be a guide, you you will as well. That, that's actually a picture of my license there. That's, actually, that's a badge you have to wear when guiding. So um, a lot of you know this story already, how I got started. I was leading hikes for years. It started with friends and family. I started doing stuff for the Boy Scouts, arranging uh, high adventure trips for them. I started leading hikes for the ADK and then the 3500 Club. Um, some of my, these some of these were private hikes, but um, um, one of those, a guy who went on one of my hikes was a licensed guide. Actually, at the time he was studying for the license to be a licensed guide and he had the Boy Scout field book with him. So, um, and I got a lot of encouragement from friends. Um, so, you know, you're really good at this, you should do it. And, and I like doing it. So uh, it kind of, it kind of uh, morphed into what it is now. That last bullet point right there is kind of key. Some people want everything arranged for them. Some people like to do all the planning themselves. I liked planning these things. Okay, I'm gonna go through a, a, a very brief history of outdoor guiding. Um, early guiding was, was kind of informal. Basically it was property owners and caretakers who knew the land and guided guests on their land. Mountain guiding became a thing starting around the early 1800s when, as climbing began to gain acceptance as a form of rec. The guides, uh, no pun intended, knew the ropes and were responsible for knowing mountain nearing routes and keeping their guests safe. At least uh, that's what everybody hoped. Uh, the earliest formation of guide associations and the first state issued licenses for guiding occurred in parts of Europe around that same time and mountain guiding became a profession. The history of wilderness guiding in New York and for that matter, the uh, history of wilderness guiding in the United States begins in the Adirondacks. The first guides there were locals who hired themselves out to visitors in the early to mid 1800s. A lot of them were from the cities, including New York. And they, they expected a, a high degree of service. Um, so the New York State Outdoor Guides Association was originally founded in 1891 as the Adirondack Guides Association. And their stated purpose was securing to the public competent and reliable guides to insist in the enforcement of forest and game laws and to maintain a uniform rate of guides wages. So it was basically a guides professional organization. Um, but part of the concern that drove that was making sure that there weren't you know, cowboys guiding and, and potentially getting people into bed. Uh, situation. So there was there was a lot of self-policing involved with that. New York State began issuing formal guide licenses as part of a voluntary program about 30 years later in 1919. And the licenses became mandatory for guides beginning in 1924. A uh, little bullet I have up there that the, the first state to issue guide license was in New York. It was 
it was Maine. And the first guide license was issued to Cordelia Crosby, who was known as Fly Rod Crosby. She was quite a force for getting people to come to Maine and use Maine guides. Um, was very well known at the time. And it's interesting that the first licensed guide in the United States was a woman. That's actually a, a photo of her in the background. So, okay, there are a couple of mountains named after Adirondack guides. Um, um, most of the Adirondack peaks are named after politicians. Uh, one that you know is Phelps. Named after old mountain Phelps, his full name was Orson Schofield Phelps. He was from Keene Valley. And he was actually not regarded by his peers as one of the better guides. But he did name several of the Adirondack peaks and he cut the first trail up Marcy. But the Phelps trail isn't named after him. His son, Ed Phelps, was widely regarded and recognized by his peers as one of the great Adirondack guides. So he was a better guide than dad. And among his accomplishments, uh, Ed Phelps served as for Plank Colvin's chief guide. Um, some of you may know who, who he is. Ed, Ed cut that Phelps trail, uh, which is still the established route to Marcy through the Johns River Valley. So I'm pretty sure that's named after him. Um, a little side note, uh, Verpank Colvin directed surveying throughout the Adirondacks and determined the, sol the uh, summit elevations of most of the peaks there. And he measured Marcy at 5,344 feet in 1875. And that's still the official height of that peak. So that's pretty impressive. Um, okay. All right, uh, the other mountain that's named after a guide in the Adirondacks is Nye Mountain. And it's named after a guy named Bill Nye. Oops, no, no, not that one, sorry. Um, this Bill Nye. Uh, Bill Nye was quite a famous guide in his day. Um, he's got Nye Mountain, which isn't actually a 4,000 footer, but it is on the 46er list named after him. Well, the thing that Bill Nye is most remembered for is this. Um, he was guiding a family around Avalanche Lake in the Adirondacks during the summer of 1868. And there is a spot where there are vertical cliffs arising directly out of the lake on both sides. So in that spot, he actually carried the wife on his shoulder. Her name was Matilda, and he carried her through the lake alongside the cliff. As her bloomers started to dip into the water behind her, her husband is said to have yelled, hitch him up, Matilda. Now, a lot of you know Avalanche Lake. Today, in that same spot on Avalanche Lake, are these um, boards that are bolted into the uh, cliff, and they are known to this day as the hitch up Matildas. So that's kind of the story of where that came from. Talking about guys named after mountains, there's Mount Moran in the Teton Range. You know who that's named after, right? Not me. This guy, Thomas Moran. Um, interesting story about Thomas Moran is that he was actually uh, lived in New York and he was a famous 18th century painter and a member of the Hudson River School. You all know Thomas Cole and, and, and some of the other artists that were historically famous around the Catskills. Um, but he painted mostly uh, of scenes in the Rockies. Had an older brother named Edward Moran, also no relation, who was a famous American painter in, in the 19th century, uh, but he specialized in maritime art. So I'm gonna kind of segue this back to what our topic is today. Um, speaking of the Grand Tetons, New York's Adirondack Park is almost twice the size of Grand Teton National Park, Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks combined. Even the Catskill Park is more than twice the size of Grand Teton National Park. So the, the important thing there is, I mean, there's a lot of room for guiding in New York. And guiding isn't just restricted to those two major parks. So moving on, um, so that's a little bit of history. To get a guide license in New York State, you have to have certain certifications. You have to have a current certification in CPR and first aid, and they accept basic American Red Cross first aid and CPR. Most guides uh, pursue a, a lot more uh, medicine, wilderness medicine training than that. But in New York State, you only need those basics plus the uh, American Red Cross basic water safety or an equivalent. Um, so I started with wilderness first aid and, and many other guides do as well. And, and, and I'm, I'm a wilderness first responder now which is a, a step higher, more training. And I'm actually going to be uh, actually starting this month teaching wilderness first aid 
Um, to get your license in New York, you also have to have a statement from a physician saying that you are fit for guiding and it has to be dated uh, within 30 days before the license is first issued or on a renewal. Uh, and then there's, uh, we mentioned that, that the written exam. Um, you have to pass a written exam. The exam has been called easy. It kind of makes it, I think, too easy, but at least it makes it a good tool to weed out people who, you know, really, really should not be responsible for the safety of others. But um, I was recently part of a working committee that rewrote the guide exam, and we just finished it in, in uh, March. So it's, it's under DEC review now before it gets rolled out as a new guides exam. We updated it to be more relevant to the required skill sets for a guide. There were some silly things in there. Um, and plus stuff has changed over 30 years. There were some of the old silly questions are gone, some outdated questions. We added more stuff about leave no trace. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not like passing the bar, but it's, it should be a little, uh, a little more pertinent to the profession than, than the existing exam had been. I was kind of proud to, to be part of that rewrite committee. Uh, and of course, the other thing to get a guide license is you need to write a check. Um, the cost is uh, $100 for the basic license plus one guiding category, and then $20 for each additional category. The categories are the six of them, things like hunting, camping, hiking, fishing, whitewater rafting and canoeing, and rock and ice climbing. So it's good for five years. So if you have all six categories, it's going to cost you $200 every five years to renew your license. In New York State, there are roughly 2,500 licensed guides. So there are quite a few. Um, there are other states where you do not have to have a license to guide things like hiking and, and, and camping. Um, almost every state, though, requires hunting and fishing licenses. The main guides are licensed to, uh, for hunting and fishing, but Maine doesn't require that hiking and camping guides be licensed, so. Okay, so you've gone through all that and now you're a guide. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot on this, but it's kind of an eye opener when you do it. Um, uh, guiding is a business and uh, you know most of us are sole proprietors, so we have to run all the different business functions. I used to just plan trips, hike and camp, and now I spend a lot of time in, in, in the back office right here where I'm sitting now, and I make jokes about the, the office time, the backcountry time ratio being too high. But, you know, you got to do this stuff, right? We won't spend a whole lot of time here, but some of the things that you do under those various functions are um, uh, listed in the bullets here. I'm redoing the website now. I don't really want to, but the world moves on and things that used to work don't work anymore. So good times there. Um, social media is an important part of your, uh, your marketing and, and outreach and, and just getting a reputation. Um, I used to do a post every day that really gets onerous, especially if you're not doing the, uh, you know, the kind of look at me selfie stuff that people like to do. I try to put value in there much like with the way I hope this presentation is, is going to be perceived. I, I, I try to educate people and not just do a sales pitch, but that actually makes it a lot more work. So it's quite a time sink. I did start a newsletter recently, um, sent the first uh, issue out in January. If anybody wants to get on the mailing list for that, get me your email address and, and I'll add you to it. I'll send you the last one and then the next one when it's ready and beyond that until you tell me to stop, but they're infrequent. So um, but, you know, that's another thing you spend a lot of work on. Um, if you do classes like uh, Map and Compass, for example, backpacking, winter hiking, you, you need to work up syllabuses, you need to work up course materials, uh, presentations, uh, some of the outreach is presentations like this one. I've done presentations at trade shows. And you don't necessarily get guiding business when you do this, but it, it, it's an important thing to do. And, and it does help to build a reputation. So the idea is that you're building a practice. Um, I've been at this five years and I'm still building a practice. New guides, um, they might be better at the business aspect than me. Uh, enough of, of the desk time. I won't spend, definitely won't spend much time on this, but you know, you got to think about their expenses. You, you, you may charge a certain amount for a trip and it, it may look like you're making money on the trip, but then when you work in all your overhead, um, you know, you have to consider all that. So there's trip related expenses. It's the equivalent of the actual cost of a product that you sell. And then there's all the overhead. The biggest single category for me 
is the um, the uh, business liability insurance. Uh, but all those other things add up, um, web hosting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll say one thing about equipment and gear because some of you are probably wondering, and I, I know I would, uh, I, I don't count my personal gear as a business expense. Uh, that really refers to um, things that I need to I need to have for clients. For example, I don't need six backpacking tents and I don't need a second bear can, things like that. So it's not, um, if you do it by the book, which I do, it's, it's not an excuse to, to expense your hobby. Okay, so um, I actually kind of do these things and think about these things, but I just started to, just to make it more concise for this presentation, put down what I think are the, four core competencies of guiding, which are <clears throat> knowledge, skills, planning, and customer service. So uh, guiding is, first of all, a hospitality business. Um, you'll hear that said, and, and it's absolutely true. And if you've ever used a guide, you know that. The trips that you're taking are the client's precious vacation time. They're not the guide's trip. They're not the guide's vacation. So providing a high level of service is key. So I'll talk just a little bit about what I mean by those four competencies. The first thing is knowledge, pretty basic stuff. You know the area where you're guiding, you know about the weather there and the terrain challenges, you know about what the weather forecast is. I mean, you, you're following lots of things that comes under planning too. Um, you know, useful and general interest information about the plants, the animals, the history, the trail conditions, things you're gonna find there that, that will affect your trip. Um, you are a reference source for the client. And really, this is very true of guiding. You get paid for what you know. That is the biggest thing right there. You get paid for what you know. So you need, you need to know this stuff. Next is skills. Obviously, if you're taking people out in the backcountry, you need to have good navigation skills. If things go wrong, you need to have that wilderness first aid and backcountry medicine background to help. Um, you need to know about camping. Uh, and backcountry travel, both from a, uh, a safety perspective and a leave no trace perspective. That's very important. So you, you have to have these skills. You can't be learning them while you're dragging uh, somebody that never met you and is a paying client along behind you. Do that with your friends if you're learning. Um, crisis management interpersonal skills are important. Um, hopefully you don't need to use the crisis management skills, but uh, interpersonal ones, when there is a problem coming uh, are very important because you you could be managing a group and not just one person. So, and I threw personal fitness under this because it's very important. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's a skill so much as a thing that you do to take care of yourself, but it, it's very important. Now, another big guiding competency is planning. And that's a key differentiator for, for just people doing their own stuff. If they don't know how to plan some of the stuff or if they don't understand the planning. Um, and these are these are things you could do with your own trips. All, all of this stuff isn't just stuff for guys. This is ways to make your own trips better. Hike leaders, family members, anybody planning trips. So for guides, it begins with understanding the goals and abilities of the client. Then you take it from there. You develop an itinerary. You get permits. You make reservations if necessary, if that's part of the service that you're offering. Um, you're planning what gear you need for the group, what gear individuals need. Uh, identifying all that, prepping that gear, um, working with the clients to make sure they have it. You're planning your routes, checkpoints, uh, any timelines, where you're hoping to camp, where you'll camp if you can't camp where you want to camp. Meal planning, four Ps. I've been calling it that ever since last night when I realized all four of these things start with P. But you plan meals if you're like on a backpack or other type of trip where you're feeding people. <clears throat> you have to purchase the ingredients. You have to prepare and package and by preparing and packaging. If you're if you're a backpacker, you know exactly what I mean. But you know, um, if it's like a multi-day thing or, or an overnight thing, I'll put breakfast all in one place at the bottom of the bear can and then tonight's dinner on top. You know, just just little things like that, but also the way food is repackaged to save space and to facilitate cooking it efficiently and in a timely manner because you are the kitchen staff also if you're doing that. Plan for the weather, monitor the weather. I, I, I use certain sources that, um, and, and I would expound upon that if somebody pressed me because I think that's very important. Um, but 
you, you're always planning and, and you have alternate plans too, because plans don't always work out exactly the way that you want whether it be what we'll do instead that we know everybody will like and be close to the original goal and how we'll bail out if we have to for safety. So finally, though, on the guiding competency, competencies is customer service. Again, this is, this is the client's trip. The client is not paying for the privilege of hiking with the guide. The client is paying for a unique experience that's tailored to him or her. So um, communicate what's being provided, and that's the same as in every business, so that you know, expectations are proper. You know, providing a high level of service is all the stuff we've been talking about. So for an example, these things almost never happen, but literally I have chopped steps in ice with an ice axe for a client, and I've used parts of my body for another client that needed help to step on to get up some tricky spots and down them. You're, you're doing that for the client. And, and actually, if you do a good job, it, it makes you feel good or, or it should. And, and that's one of the, uh, that's the next bullet really here is passion for what you are doing. If you love what you're doing and it shows it's contagious. If you come to work with a chip on your shoulder, that client's not going to want to see you again. You, you got to love what you're doing. Um, be a good listener, respect all ideas. People that know me well, friends and family will tell you, I sometimes struggle with this. So I'm working on it, um, but I've gotten quite good at it when guiding. Hopefully that'll help me improve in my non-guiding life. It, it's, it's, it's a gift. It's important to, for the client to know that you care, that you pick up on their fears and f when they're fatigued, the things that they're enjoying, uh, how past experiences affect them. Um, th it helps you to manage a better experience for them. Um, you might pick up on things that you should have already known, like the food allergy that the client neglected to mention on the health form. So all this helps you to make a better experience for your client. So, um, you know, that's important when planning for a trip and, and then during delivery, the whole idea of, of, of being good listen and respecting the customer. Everybody knows these days to, to kind of stay away from politics and things like that. But um, whether or not <clears throat> you can uh, make somebody else do that, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you listen to them and you be respectful of their views. And if it's something, you know, if it's something that you feel contentious about, that leave that home. That's not for guiding. So finally, um, I, I kind of like this. I feel that the guide service is a relationship, not a commodity. So I am available to clients before, during, and after a trip. I'll help them. I'll work with them on their getting outfitted or, or even just asking me questions about trails and things. Uh, people call me and, and ask me questions for their own trips, and I'm happy to answer them. So relationships are very important. All right, enough of that. Um, I had to put food in there. Food is very important. Food is very important to me. Everybody that knows me knows that. But when you think about it, food relaxes, nourishes, and comforts people. And it's a central part of most of our favorite experiences. So why should guiding be any different? But I like to do happy hour, which is what's left in the uh, plate in the upper right. I've had clients ask me for recipes. So I type stuff up and provided it. So food, food is, if you do food, do it well, that's important. As for what keeps me busy, mostly backpacking. My biggest category last year was Adirondack backpacking, mostly from people who were peak bagging trips that, that were too long for them to do in a day. So I also run um, you know, day hikes and things, but those are the bigger categories. I would love to run multinational trips. If you want to make money guiding, you have to do longer trips. Those are the ones that work the best. I, I don't and I don't make any money doing a half day hike and, you know, I'm lucky to break even on, on, on a day hike, but I do those things because it, it introduces me to clients. It keeps me out in the field and guiding and getting exercise. Um, I did a dry run a couple of years ago of a hiking tour in Ireland. There were some kinks to work out. And honestly, the more I think about it, I love to use local guides for the same reason. I think I'm valuable as a local guide here. So um, the toughest nuts transportation, but the thing that's really killed even trying to go any further with that is COVID, but hopefully some kind of international stuff because that is, it's, it's just so rewarding and fun to do that. Um, I may 
do some more shakeout trips or maybe uh maybe i'll mention it to some of you and we'll do some stuff at cost and you'll just accept the uh the the roses with the thorns on that um and i'm gonna spare you the old joke no i won't uh old joke uh, said by many professions the best way to make a small fortune guiding is to start with a large fortune so uh, one more slide about making your own trips better um that's actually my brother-in-law i took him on his first backpack years ago uh, plan on weekdays if you can these days trailheads in the northeast trails are very crowded and campsites are very crowded and the adirondacks aren't going to get any better when they finally do the flip over to the new central and, and outer zones you're not going to be able to camp at anywhere but a designated site at, at a, near a lot of the high peaks and some of them that's already the case so so if you really want a good experience plan a week so follow the weather um don't get surprised by the weather uh, before you go right out of a trip plan. It's, 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 it's a project. It's like managing a project, especially some of the bigger trips. Have a checklist. Um, plan what you're going to do. Plan the food, like I said before. And when you're out there hiking, doing a trip, do, doing a, um, a, a, a trail you haven't done before or, or even a trail you have, make some notes of things you see, things for future trips. I like to make notes of good campsites and practice your skills. You know, the, the basics, setting up a tent, um, to, to more advanced stuff like uh, fire starting, cooking, you know, prepare and have the right gear. That's important stuff um, to make your own trips better. So um, switching gears now to a lighter, but not completely tongue in cheek look at what makes a guide. So let's say you have all the basic skills and prerequisites for being a guide, but you'll know you're a guide when, uh, and that picture is real, unfortunately, um, when your bedroom looks like an REI garage sale, when the Adirondack peaks that you've hiked most often are Allen and Cooks Akraga. When your kitchen has only one pot and sleeping in the office is awesome. Uh, the, the, the first, second and bullet there are true. Uh, the kitchen equipped, not so much, but it's a reference for those of you who backpack to the one pot and camping meals. So, Okay, um, and finally, um, I've had some interesting trips, some that really meant a lot to me. I mean, they're all I haven't had a bad trip. I just, I just love doing this, but um, each trip is different, but these ones were rewarding in different ways. So one, I, I call it Everest on Hudson, um, just because it seems like that trip deserves a name. I had a client call me and he requested a Devil's Path backpack in the winter and he wanted an Everest-like base camp experience because he was planning to hike Mount Everest. Basically, I had to hire a second guide and two porters to assist with this. And um, we had a campsite set up in advance. We, we started at the beginning to get Devil's Path. It was winter. Um, we had fire going, campsite set up. I, I, I did most of the cooking, but we had happy hour for them while, while the main meal was cooked after we got there. Pretty much everything was provided by the guides, uh, except we didn't set up prayer flag. The second day of the plan, for the client's request, was to wake up at 2 a.m., <clears throat> simulation of the early start before the summit of Everest. The group was kind of slow, so plans got altered a lot, but but that happens. Um, so this we went up the day before, a couple of the guys that were helping me out, <clears throat> just to scope out where we'd be camping, um, and, and we, we kind of planned how to uh, how to get the gear up there without doing it the hard way over the devil's path. Uh, we left that one big old Coleman tent up the day before to use as a gear tent. And we kind of experimented a little with, um, with, with using a sled. We didn't have a pulk, but it wasn't too steep an area. Um, in Kahlo, if you know the area. So uh, that actually uh, worked out, but the guys that hiked the most that weekend were the porters. Uh, the two guys we hired to set up because <clears throat> even though it was only a, less than a mile each way from where they were able to pull the truck, they had to go up and back about six times with all the gear for this group. And one of the guys got sick. And so the other one pretty much had to unpack and, and break down and bring everything down himself the next day. I think he hiked at least 20 miles getting everything out of there. We did a lot for them. We pulled it together. Right, this is our group. Um, they they went. I, I said, you guys will need spikes and ice axes. I, I provided snowshoes for them, which we turned out not to need because of the snow conditions. Um, and they went and they went to REI and spent a lot of money. Yet somehow, curiously, these came. 
<laughs> these gators were kind of funny. Um, they were made of plastic shopping bags and some kind of yellow duct tape. <laughs> so that was uh, not something I was expecting. Um, but it was it, it was a good trip. Uh, we, we were slow. This is uh, coming down Sugarloaf at night in in the ice. And we did get to use the ice axes for something other than tomahawks, which is what they were doing when I first found them in the parking lot, throwing them at trees. So there was a lot of instruction on that. A little short video clip or two of them here. So. Get some video? Yes, nice. sir. That's cool, man. I think I did get through this hole. Yeah. That's video now. So cool. Anyway, I really love this trip because of stuff we were able to pull together for them. Um, they, you know, things didn't go as planned, mostly because they were kind of a slow group. Um, I got up a half hour before everybody else at two in the morning after not getting to bed till like 11 because we got to camp so late and started making coffee and all and then chatting and drinking coffee till the sun was practically up. So that didn't work out as planned. And um, that second day, there was a snowstorm coming in probably around five o'clock that evening. So we, we knew that we were not going to make the whole devil's path without uh, without getting caught up in that and probably getting in at one in the morning. So I was, you know, I, I said, hey, if you want to do it, I'll do it. But I was relieved when, when, when they agreed not to because I was working so hard on that trip. Um, I was I was tired, basically. So but I would have kept going. Um, so they, <clears throat> we've got to, we only made it to uh, Route 214 by, by uh, uh, Stony Clove there. So it was a beautiful day, even though it was gone to snow. So um, they, we did a little bushwhacking up the side of Hunter there and they reverted to the original, uh, not quite appropriate use of ice axes, but, but they had a good time doing it. Probably. You're good. <laughs> Ready? Mm -hmm. Two, one. Woo! Ah! Holy shit. Wow. Look out below. Ice fall. Yeah. <laughs> You're good? And so that was pretty much how we ended our day there. And, and like I said, that was so interesting to me, A, because of the group. They were a fun group. Um, only one of them was planning to do Everest, and he was fortunate to not do it. But um, that was 2019, actually. So um, that was not a good year on Everest. Um, I have, a, I think that's still on his, uh, on his uh, bucket list. So um, now, more recently, this past fall, I, I did a trip with... Uh, Janet, a 78-year-old woman who wanted to become a 46er. Um, she had done all the peaks, many of them, many times because she took her children there first and then her grandchildren, but she'd never hiked Allen. So, um, you know, she's 78 years old now, and it was, um, it was a real challenge for her. They hired me to kind of help them get there. We did it as a three-day backpack. Um, her daughter and a friend of hers joined. Her daughter was a godsend between me and her daughter, she would not have got there without both of us there. So that was really rewarding. Literally, when we got to the summit, there, there were tears, including mine. And, and in fact, I still get kind of still get that that kind of kind of happy, teary watching the video that I'm going to show you in a second uh, when she first made it to the summit. That's at the trailhead on the Horace Road, uh, crossing one of the bridges near the start. And um, you know, if you've hiked Allen or heard of Allen, you know about the famous red slime up the slide. Um, she hiked without a backpack. We carried her stuff. She had she had water on her, so she didn't have to ask us for water. But um, we, we, we did everything we could to make it work for her. And boy, did she work hard. Um, her daughter offered her so much encouragement because there were times she wanted to quit. And being the guide, I wouldn't have said Okay, keep going. This is this is what it looked like when she got there, and this is I just just is still moving.
I'm, I'm literally doing it again watching this. This is being part of stuff like this is just awesome. There's a great thing about guiding. Getting paid to do it, it's just unbelievable. I do this one for free. In fact, I, I, I'm, I'm hiking with her uh, occasionally to keep her in shape because there was, it's more of the summit celebration. There's uh, her, her and her daughter at the Allen viewpoint looking toward the central high peaks there. Um, there was a bit of a miscalculation. She had hiked the Santanonis before with her family and, and then recalled you know, her husband, who, who, who doesn't hike these days, but is still active with her, but her husband had become ill or something, and they actually never made it to Cooksacraga. So, you know, she was, oh, what do I do? I don't think I can do it. She's decided and determined that she's going to do Cooksacraga. So we kind of, uh, we, we, we kind of got her some kudos for finishing, <laughs> and she didn't finish. So as a guide, sometimes you only know about your clients what they tell you. Um, but she's honest. And um, so it's going to be when we get her there this summer, 62 years from her first peak to her last, which if you check the uh, 80K 46 or finisher lists, that will be the most anybody's ever taken. So um, that pretty much wrapping up. This was a Girl Scout troop. I taken them uh, one time on their first backpack and they brought me back for another backpack the next year and I took them up the never sink in the Catskills and I, I suggested to them that they could uh, do a little map and compass and, and learn a little bushwhacking and go to Lone Mountain and they said yeah we want to do that it was challenging for them um, but um, but they did it and they loved it and they found the canister so stuff like that is nice um, I, mean, I have a history with uh, Boy Scout troops, but I, I don't. I don't have girls of my own, so I've never been involved with any Girl Scout troops. They were a good bunch, and um, they had a, a leader there who who was encouraging them to do this stuff. Sometimes hard to find that with the boys in the Boy Scout troops. So I was very impressed by this bunch. And this was another trip we did. Uh, called it the Four Corners backpack. We basically stayed at uphill lean to and did a lot of peak bagging. Um, it was a great trip. One of the things we did on the second morning there was we got up real early. The idea was to hike to the summit of Skylight to see the sunrise, but we weren't really fast enough for that. I, I, I made coffee and we had coffee and watched the sunrise over Lake Tier of the Clouds. And there were a lot of things about that trip that was special. This, this was one of the cool moments. So. This is more of a slide I just threw up here, just because that's my way of saying, "Hey, we're we're we're, we're done." <laughs> but um, you know, why hire a guide service? And it's all stuff we've spoken about. Um, so don't mean for it to be too salesy. Um, I, if if you didn't have time to read it and you really want to, let me know. I'll I'll, I'll hook you up. Um, also, again, if anybody wants the newsletter, you can send email to uh, edmarinagemail.com. Uh, feel free to use this contact information to, for any questions you might have, advice, um, uh, talk about how to become a guide. I'm, I certainly um, be, uh, I, I know we have at least one person here who's interested in being a guide. So um, now uh, I guess you can all unmute and I'll take any questions. Ed. Yes, sir. Is, you said there's six categories of guiding. Yeah. Are the tests different for each category? Uh, yeah, so there's a general section, then there's a section for um, hiking and, and, and camping, and obviously separate stuff for fishing and hunting, because there are different disciplines. So um, there's also all the requirements. For example, the way it works in New York State, if you're going to be a, a whitewater guide, either for rafting, canoeing, or uh, kayaking on whitewater, you get licensed for the river you're going to run on. So you have to have run X number of trips on that river. And there's some other requirements. Uh, obviously anybody who is, um, is hunting and fishing in addition to having a guide license has to have their hunting and fishing license. That's not a requirement for hiking and camping. But yeah, there are separate sections of the exam. Hey, Linda. Hi, you may have covered this, so don't answer it if you did. Um, but our, first of all, are, is there a law that requires you to have a a guide, guide license if you advertise your services? Is it a law in New York and is it a law in all states or just some states? Uh, all the states are different. In New York, if you are going to basically charge money for directing people in the wilderness, 
uh, you have to have a license that does not apply to clubs like the ADK. Um, some certain summer camps, it doesn't apply to scouting organizations. So um, now if a scouting organization hires me as a guide to take a, a group of youths and adults on a trip, I have to have a guide license for that. Right. So money seems, sounds to me like the big issue. Um, that makes it a commercial outfit operation. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the, uh, yeah, I, the exact wording is I had pasted that up earlier. Um, and it, I'll read it again. A guide license is required in New York to offer services for hire that include directing, instructing, or aiding a client in, in these various activities. Okay. And, and there, and like I said, there are those exceptions. Uh, ADK hike leaders are, are don't do not need a do not need a guide license, and there are other people that don't. So, great presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, do you have concerns about liability when transporting your clients? Yes. So um, that 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 kind of raises the possibility of mentioning some other interesting stuff. So. Um, there are guide companies in New York that transport clients, and, and, and that makes sense in the city because a lot of people in the city, you know, they like to recreate in the mountains as well, but they don't have cars. So, um, you know, I, I like to say they don't need a guide, they need a ride, but um, <laughs> that, um, that, that's actually a, a viable business. Uh, one of them actually kind of went under because of COVID, but got kind of restarted by somebody else. There's, a, there's at least a couple that I know of there. Um, another one so that was, I thought the biggest one disappeared. I don't know what happened to them, but um, I, um, I cannot buy my insurance, you know, offer any kind of like a taxi service. I can't do that. And I don't want to go there. Um, both for logistical and financial reasons. However, you know, I, I, I will carpool with people. Um, it, it's, it, you know, I usually prefer the drive just because that's how I am, but I've, I've actually at least once been a passenger in a client's car. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't want to be silly about, you know, everybody taking separate cars and all, but I cannot offer transportation. And, and I think if I needed to, I would get another service to do it. That's kind of one of the issues for doing international trips. You need a ride when you need it, but I can't really be in a foreign country driving a van full of people. That's just not a good idea. So that answer your question? Yes. Okay, um, any other? Sure. Great. Well, thank you for letting me speak to you. Um, I, I can say that putting this together was good for me. I mean, I, I think about this stuff all the time, but having to organize it was a good exercise. But so thanks. Well, thank all you, right, Eric. Eric. Thanks. Very good.